but you want a business that can compound capital at that kind of rate. So once you find businesses that are like that, that have those good returns, then you really have to kind of dig in and figure out why they earn those returns because we know the nature of capitalism is that there's going to be competition. If you're over there making all kinds of money, it's not like uh, you're just going to keep doing it and no one's going to pay any attention. People are going to be like, wow, she's making all kinds of money in her business. Maybe I should do something similar. And that's what kind of brings down those returns on capital is having a lot of competition. So I spend a lot of time and I would recommend this is where investors should put most of their time figuring out what makes that business special. Why are they able to earn those kinds of returns? What kind of competitive advantage do they have over their competition? And how are they going to be able to protect that return over a long period of time? Those are the essentials right there. You start with that. Welcome back to the Millennial Investing Podcast. I'm your host, Robert Leonard, and on today's show, I am joined by Chris Mayer. Chris, welcome to the show. Good to be on with you. I want to start today by talking a little bit about the study you did for your book, 100 Baggers, which is all about how to find stocks that can give you 100x your return. It's my understanding that you spent a lot of money on this study in the book and a lot of time and energy finding these sample of stocks that have gone on to become 100 baggers. Give us a little overview of your process and what you found. Sure. Yeah. So, you know, it was inspired by a book that came out in 1971 called 100 to 1 in the Stock Market by Thomas Phelps. And he had done this study where he looked at all the stocks that had gone up at least you know, 100 times. I think he started in the 30s up to when he published his book. And I love that book. And then uh, I had a friend of mine who suggested, hey, you should update it. So that's what kind of the inspiration came from. And so, yeah, I mean, the trickiest part was getting all the data together. So that took some time and money. And I worked with another analyst to help me kind of extract everything. And then you know, we found about uh, 365 names that had gone up at least 100 times, which ironically is the same number that Phelps found in his study. And um, that was what we did. I mean, I had some uh, market cap limitations, so I cut off some of the very smallest stocks. So because I was trying to get something that we could maybe see some predictable tra traits, you know, in the financials or in the business itself. So I took out like, you know, those little tiny mining stocks that go maybe from like 15 cents to $15 or whatever. So that was the, basically the universe. And there were a lot of interesting things that I found. I guess we, we can get into those as we go along. A couple of the examples are Pepsi, Monster Energy, and Amazon. And it's hard to generalize these three situations or scenarios because they were all so different. Amazon looked too expensive. Pepsi always kind of seemed underwhelming. And then Monster Energy just went through so many ups and downs. So I know it's difficult to generalize, but what were some of the common characteristics that you found common to all the hundred baggers that you studied? You said it very well. I mean, that's one of the things too. When I uh, when I did the study, it was very hard. I thought going into it that I w might be able to get kind of a template, or I might be able to generalize what some of those things were. But as I got into it, yeah, they were very different. I mean, even in terms of you know margins, kinds of businesses they were in, a lot of differences. But I guess if I were to really kind of force myself to think of some commonalities. And I talk about them in the book. I mean, one is, of course, that the businesses all grew a lot. So, you know, all these businesses were much, much larger after their journey when they started. So, you know, you have to find businesses that are able to grow. And so what are some of those key components of growth? Because not just growth, but you want profitable growth. You want growth that's you know, economic. And so I would say, you know, these businesses all generated very high returns or high returns in their capital. And they were able to sustain that year after year after year for decades. If you look at the whole population that uh, of hundred baggers, it kind of formed this little bell curve. And um, most of the names kind of fell in that it took 20 to 25 years of time, which is about 20 to 25% a year in annual compounding. So that kind of sets the parameters. Outside of that, then you have to have things like I mean, you have to be able to survive all the ups and downs of the cycle. So, you know, many of the businesses had pretty good financial, you know, pretty good balance sheets or pretty good financial shape. And uh, many of the businesses had some sort of entrepreneur behind them. So this was another, not a critical theme. There were a bunch, there were many exceptions, but it seemed like a lot of them had some entrepreneur. So, you know, you think about Walmart and you think about Sam Walton, or you think about Apple and you got Steve Jobs and there's always a not always, but there was often an entrepreneurial force, at least in the beginning, it could be an entrepreneur or a family of some sort. So those were some of the things that they had in common. Talk to us a bit about how early an investor needed to be in these companies to get 100x their return or 100x their investment. 
did they have to buy into the company at the IPO? Could they get on a little bit after the IPO? Or were there a bunch of opportunities throughout these companies' history that an investor could have 100x their returns? Yeah, this is maybe a misconception people have that they think they have to be in really early. But with these 100 baggers, you had many opportunities. And often you could buy them year after year. You could pay the 52-week high price for that year and the year after and the year after and, and still make 100 times your return. So yeah, I mean, the lesson there is it's not so much about you know market timing or how early you were. I mean, there have always been stories, for example, with Berkshire Hathaway, even when he was not even halfway through the journey where people would speculate whether he was, you know, it was already done or it's already played out. And so you have to resist those I like to say, you know, focus more on uh, more on that underlying engine, the business itself, and how it's compounding, and and not worry so much about you know where you are and the, and where you are in the age of the company. You know, you don't have to get in, like you said, at the IPO. You mentioned how the company needs a long runway for growth, and that's typically easier with a smaller company. So, what can you tell us about the market cap of these companies? Yeah. So, I mean, the, I think the average starting market cap, if I remember, it was less than 500 million and the companies were fairly substantial businesses already. I think 170 million or so in sales. And so it's not like, you know, they're tiny, but they're certainly not 30 or $40 billion market caps either. So I think my opinion has changed a little since I wrote the book, because when I wrote the book initially, I I think in there, I, I told people to focus on market caps. I forget what the number was, 300 million or 500 million, pretty small. I think you can relax that a little bit. You know, I don't think you should hesitate. If you find a really good business that meets all these other things we're talking about, but it's got a $2 billion market cap or a $6 billion market cap, I don't think you should, you know, avoid it or, or pass it on because uh, it's really hard to predict, you know, what company will get to 100x. I wouldn't like try to imagine necessarily that it goes up 100x. I'd focus on, again, those, does it have those characteristics? Does it have a really good business? Does it have a mode it can defend? Is it something that seems like it can compound for a decade or more? And then, and then you kind of follow the story and, and let's see you go. I mean, I mean, the thing about it is, and I talk about this in the book, if you aim big, you know, you aim for that 100x and you don't get it, you're probably still going to have a pretty good result. I mean, if you get 50 times or 25 times your money, I think everybody will be very happy with that. I think one of the hardest parts of buying 100 baggers is the mentality or psychology piece of it. I mean, of course, finding these companies, finding these opportunities is very, very difficult. And that, But that's step one. Once you've done that, the hard part is really being able to weather the storm. I mean, you look at Amazon and it looks like it was a, a given. If you look back now, hindsight's 2020, it seems like, you know, everybody should have been involved. But there, if you if you zoom in, there have been periods of time where these companies have lost a lot of money. You know, you have to be able to weather the storm. Companies have lost more than 50% of their value at some points. Some some companies even multiple times. You have to really have the kind of wherewithal or the gut to stomach these types of things. Talk to us a bit about the mindset that you need and what type of investor you need to be to hold these stocks to, to get these 100x returns. Yeah, you have to be very patient and you have to be able to take the ups and downs and not only the ups and downs, but then there's long stretches where the stocks went nowhere. So, you know, I usually say, now, Berkshire Hathaway, for example, was the best performing stock in that study. And even that stock had at least three different times where it was cut in half. And then just as difficult, there was a seven-year stretch where it went nowhere. So think about that. I mean, some of these stocks require you to hold on to them for years and they went nowhere. And right, And this was right in the midst of going up a hundred times. So the market will test your patience. And this is why I think it's important for investors who want to invest this way, that they have a different scorecard other than just looking at the market price all the time and judging it, the investment by the market price, but looking at the business. I mean, is the business growing? Is it, is it continuing to perform? You know, one of the tables I remember from Phelps's book that really stuck with me, and then I wind up having similar tables in my book where he, he used the example of Pfizer, and he just shows some basic financial data over a 20-year period of time, and he asks you if you would just seeing those figures, if you would ever sold the business, of course you wouldn't have, because every year it was doing pretty well. Um, but if you look at the stock chart, you know during that time it was up, down, long stretches where it went nowhere. So this is a big part of it. I'd say this is probably every bit as challenging as just the idea of finding the great business to begin with, and then having the ability to hold on to them. I know you just mentioned some of the things on your checklist now, but what are you looking for in terms of? qualitative metrics, and also quantitative metrics. Break down your checklist for finding great businesses a bit more. 
quantitative metrics would be, I always, and I just say return on capital, because I know that's kind of vague, but I mean, it's because I look at a lot of different things. I mean, I look at return on equity, return on invested capital, return on capital employed, and these are all just standard definitions you can Google and, and see, you know, how they're calculated. A lot of financial websites these days even calculate them for you. But we know that getting that 100 bagger level is basically a math problem at the end of the day. If you compound 25% a year, you're going to get there in 20 years. And you're not going to hit that every year. Of course, there'll be some years down, some years up. But you want a business that can compound capital at that kind of rate. So once you find businesses that are like that, that have those good returns, then you really have to kind of dig in and figure out why they earn those returns. Because we know the nature of capitalism is that there's going to be competition. If you're over there making all kinds of money, it's not like uh, you're just going to keep doing it and no one's going to pay any attention. People are going to be like, wow, she's making all kinds of money in her business. Maybe I should do something similar. And that's what kind of brings down those returns on capital is having a lot of competition. So I spend a lot of time and I would recommend this is where investors should put most of their time in figuring out what makes that business special. Why are they able to earn those kinds of returns? What kind of competitive advantage do they have over their competition? And how are they going to be able to protect that return over a long period of time? Those are the essentials right there. You start with that. Maybe it's just my perception, but it does seem like these days it, it's getting harder for companies to keep their competitive advantage for 10 or 20 years. Whereas, you know, maybe a couple of decades ago, it was easier to maintain a competitive advantage and reach that 100 bagger status because you need to usually hold it for 10 years, generally, like you've said. So, you know, this, this competitive advantage piece and the time in which you're able, a company is able to hold their competitive advantage has, is, is interesting, something to think about. So how do you reconcile these two kind of ideas in the companies that you look at? Yeah, I think that's objectively true, what you're saying. I mean, we see it in the corporate lifespans of businesses that are, they're coming down, they're briefer. <laughs> so it's definitely tougher nowadays. And uh, yeah, I mean, I think that's true and um, something you have to be aware of. And sometimes, you know, I, I think about sometimes like, we wrote the book, I might have to have a, a chapter on uh, what sort of unmakes these hundred baggers. But certainly, I think you have to be aware of technological change and obsolescence. So some businesses are more subject to that. Um, you know, one of the things I pay a lot of attention to is just the structure of the industry, like how many competitors. Sometimes you're, you're going to be a small player and there's just a sea of competition versus some industries are structured where there might only be one or two major players. So, you know, for example, there's a company called Copart and in that industry, it's Copart and Insurance Auto Auctions. They're kind of a duopoly. And so that kind of situation just on the face of it is more appealing than buying a company that has maybe 2% of the market and there's, you know, 50 competitors out there. So sometimes that can give you a clue as well. But I would say, you know, you have to really focus on competition, where it's likely to come from, and then dig into those competitive advantages because some competitive advantages are better than others. You know, if you if your sole competitive advantage is you have a brand that you're able to charge more for, that's usually a good competitive advantage. But if you think out 10 years or longer, you know, it might not be the best because we've seen brands that kind of lose their luster, right? We could probably come up with some examples. But if you have something that's more difficult to break, like imagine you're know, trying to break a network effect, like say a Google, you know, how difficult it would be to get, first you got to get people to use your search engine. And if that's, it would be, a, you know, an example of a very strong competitive advantage, I think. So there is a lot of qualitative stuff as well, which is hard to, you know, give you a definite checklist where you can say, well, this is, you know, this is what you want to see. It's a, an analysis you have to do and think about and compare that competitive and how strong it is compared to what the competition is doing. How often do you reassess the competitive advantages of the companies that you're invested in? Is it every time you're keeping up with the company? Is it yearly? What seems like a red flag and makes you potentially want to sell the stock if you think it's gone that way and maybe their, their competitive advantages are, are gone? Yes. And this is getting to a very difficult subject of investing is like when to sell. It's probably the hardest decision of all. So, you know, the one is when your thesis changes, people say, and that's a good longstanding investment wisdom there. But what does it mean when your thesis changes? You know, what do you really see? So that, I think it's a great question. And uh, I think, you know, there are no easy answers, but when you buy a stock, you know, uh, what I do is I write down like a I have internal memos and things I write down why I bought it and it'd be very clear and specific. And when those things start to change for the worse, that's when you really have to reassess what you're doing and it might be time to leave. You know, I look at every quarterly release that comes out, but I think that not much really changes in a quarter. So I'd be reluctant to make 
any kind of change just because somebody had a bad quarter or yeah. So, you know, I'd say like once a year, good assessment. And then it's not only, not only that, but you know, sometimes there's news that comes out if a, if a new competitor is, has come into play here that you didn't factor in or didn't see and your company starts to lose market share, that, that would be a big warning flag that might be time to go. So it's really an ongoing assessment. It never really ends, but at least I would say for most people, you would want to check in at least annually, give it a good look. We've talked a bit about business quality and your checklist for quality, but how do you think about valuation in your investment process? And at what point would you maybe rule out a company that hits your checklist or satisfies your checklist for being a great quality company, but you just don't like the valuation, you just don't like the price? Yeah. Well, first you, you did the interview in the right order because it's definitely spent a lot more time on the business itself. And then, you know, that's the harder piece to fill out. And once you have that business, then you have to think about the valuation and price you're going to pay. And maybe you don't like the price now. You can wait. You maybe buy a little bit now and then you leave yourself lots of room to buy more as you go along. But the way I think about valuation is really kind of simple. And so I have an estimate of what I think that business can earn, what kind of return on capital and you kind of project out over five and 10 is usually what I do. And then put some sort of multiple on that that you think is reasonable. And then what's your IRR to present? So it's hard to get what I call in the book, the twin engines, where you, as you mentioned, you get multiple expansion along the way. That is like Nirvana. If you can find that, if you can find a company, a great business that checks all the things we talked about and it's out there for 10 times earnings and, and you own it. And at the end of, you know, 10 years is trading at 40. That really helps a lot. Those are very hard to find though. You might get chances along the way where that happens, but they are hard to find. So that's really how I think about valuation. And then I have a certain hurdle that I want. And a lot of times, because I'm working with what I think are reasonable or maybe you know assumptions, I'm looking for at least 15% compound annual return. But you can dial that up and down depending on what kind of assumptions you make. If you make different assumptions, you may have a different hurdle rate. So it's more of a personal thing there as to what you're going to make your hurdle rate be, but you have to think about valuation in that kind of context. This brings me back to your case study of Amazon. And I personally think of companies that I've found, even after reading your book, where they meet everything on my checklist. They've been compounding at a good rate for a decade or more. They have high returns on invested capital. They have great management, all of those things. But it's at a PE of 80 or, or even higher. And so... If I think it's reasonable for this to be at least 30 in maturity, that's still a massive multiple contraction. And so I just can't justify it today. But then you watch it keep going up over the years. And so I'm not sure how to approach that. Sure, sure. I've had stories like that too, where, you know, you just, it's a great business and it just always seems to trade at really difficult prices. So I think you're not going to be able to hit all of them, right? So some of them you're just going to, you're going to be frustrated and be like, gosh, you know, I could have bought that five years ago and it was trading very expensive. It's still, <laughs> still very expensive. So yeah, everyone has their own wheelhouse too about what they feel comfortable with. And I would agree with you that probably 80 times is pretty far out there because you have to make some really optimistic assumptions for something like that to pay out. Now, of course, plenty of companies have, and you may have heard of Terry Smith and he has done this analysis where he looks at, you know, he goes back and says, or looks at how much you could have paid for some of these big winners. And it's always like astounding multiples, right? You could have bought, you know, L'Oreal for 150 times earnings or something and still made 10% annualized because it did so well. And uh, I've done that with some of my holdings too. You just roll it back 10 years and say, well, what price earnings ratio could you have paid and still made 15% a year? And it's always surprising. You know, it's always a surprisingly high number. So this is just as investors, we just, it's difficult. We have to balance out this view of, you know, you want to try to be realistic about what a great business can achieve. And at the same time, you don't want to overpay because it's painful. As you mentioned, if you pay something 80 times something, and then it goes to 30 over the next two years, that's a painful and harsh headwind to overcome. So have you seen the companies you study revert, these high growth companies revert to an industry average multiple over time? Can we kind of estimate that as, a, as the potential contraction or is that not the right way to think about it? No, I don't think so. I, well, I mean, I think that these big winners that we're talking about often are able to resist those mean reversion trends for a very, very long period of time. So I would say it's pretty common for 100 baggers in the study to trade at large premiums to the market. 
it's not like they were a secret. So, um, yeah, I think uh, you're, you'll wind up paying a premium sometimes and it's okay because it will always, as you say, it will hold its multiple for quite a long time and it will grow into it and, and you'll still do very well. So there's it's not any hard and fast rules here. I think it's kind of a case by case. But in general, I would definitely feel safe with the conclusion that many of these stocks traded expensive for good chunks of their history. How do you think about unprofitable companies or do those just not even make it to your list? Because a lot of small companies these days, it seems, aren't profitable. And you kind of have to make a bet on their future growth and their future profitability. So how do you think about these unprofitable companies? Yeah. I mean, this is where I think, again, it's maybe more of a personal preference what you can do here. But for me, I uh, it's a basic filter. They have to be making money, have to be profitable. And I have to see the good returns now, not some sort of a money loser now that maybe five years from now will turn the corner. It's, I think it's just, it's less risky to focus on companies that are profitable. But as you mentioned, there are certainly lots of companies that were unprofitable at first. And if you were correct, <laughs> you really got paid pretty well. Are there any adjustments that you make to maybe compare apples to apples better with unprofitable companies versus profitable companies or even technology companies or healthcare or anything like that? You know, some analysts will adjust for R&D. So are there any adjustments you make like that? Sure. Yeah, you have to be careful about that, right? Because otherwise you wind up kind of talking yourself into something that's not true. But certainly the accounting realities don't always reflect the economic realities. And, you know, I focus on cash flow. And- uh, and free cash flow. Um, but some companies have CapEx. And then if you were to ding them for that, then they trade at very high multiples of free cash flow. But if you were to look at the CapEx as uh, something they actually get a return on and that you know propels the business forward, that's part of what makes it grow, then yeah, it's not such a negative. So I have a few companies in the portfolio where I like it when they have a lot of CapEx because their return on that capital is very high. I want them to invest. And so in that case, I'm trying to look at the valuation of the cash underlying free cash flow generating power of the business. I do back out those growth capex. I think that's you definitely have to do that. And it can be a similar argument with with R and D, certain kinds of R and D. So you really have to know your company well and and see what makes sense. I like the example you had in the book where he, you were quoting someone else, I believe, but they said that if a company isn't reinvesting their money, you can expect that high return on equity or their or a high return on invested capital to decrease because otherwise they're just putting their money in in T-bills that's not earning a lot. So you would then expect it to decline over time. Does that suggest it's a warning sign when a company isn't reinvesting most of their cash back into their business? Yeah, absolutely. I think so. I and mean, this is something I definitely pay attention to. I look at the reinvestment rate. And I remember Thomas Phelps this is one of the more controversial things he said in his first book, which when he said dividends can be an expensive luxury. So companies, when they have the cash, they can pay it out in the form of a dividend, or like you said, they could just kind of sit on it. Ideally, you know, we're looking for these companies that are going to be big winners, hundred baggers. We want companies to have high returns and then we want them to reinvest as much as possible because that really is what propels the growth going forward. And every once in a while, you'll find the rare business that can maintain a high return on equity without having any need to reinvest. You know, they just business that spit off cash and have no need for it. And and in those cases, uh, you'll have to make some exceptions, but most businesses require some reinvestment to grow. And we want to see them deploy that capital, especially if they're earning 30, 25% return on their equity. Talk to us a bit more about what reinvestment rate you look at, or maybe how it differs from different investments, different industries, different companies, and, and what your outlook is for these companies. Yeah, I mean, you know, it's kind of a, you think of it almost as like a basic kind of math problem. So if you have a company that's earning 20% return on equity, but then pays out half of it in dividend and only reinvests half, you know, it's your kind of compounding is half the ROE because it's paid out. It's paid out most of that capital versus someone who's earning 20%, but reinvesting the whole thing. Then you're getting 20%, 20%, 20%, assuming that they can get that 20% return on the money they reinvest, which those are the business we want to find. And sometimes it's actually even increasing over time as they get bigger, as they benefit from economies of scale, that return on incremental capital they're reinvesting can actually be higher so that you see ROE start to trend up over time. Those are really nice situations that if you can find a business that's at 15% on its way to being 25 over a decade, that would probably be a wonderful investment. And then you're also factoring in and always considering their leverage when you're looking at return on equity and just making sure that it's not boosting that. 
And that's kind of why you were looking at return on capital and other metrics as well. Yes. Yes. That's why I don't, I hesitate to kind of like point to a specific metric because then people will be looking at ROEs and not recognizing that a big drawback of ROE is that you can juice it up with leverage, as you mentioned. And sometimes it doesn't work if a company is doing a lot of buybacks, you know, that can mess up the the equity piece of the equation. So you, you do have to kind of look at a spread of different return metrics for sure. How do hundred baggers today even get on your radar? How are you searching for these stocks at that? And what does that, like at the very beginning, early steps of your process, what does it look like? Yeah, I'm, it's a combination of things. I mean, some of it's screening for businesses with high returns. Um, I've def- definitely found businesses that way. And I'm looking all over the world, mostly Western Europe, North America, as a practical matter. And then just a lot of reading, talking to people, other investors. So uh, I'm really agnostic where the ideas come from. They can come from almost anywhere, sometimes just accidental. You know, you read, you're researching one company and you find out about another company could be a competitor or supplier, and then you find out you like that company better. So for me, it's not really been a super systematic approach. I was watching some YouTube videos in preparation for this interview. I was also watching some other interviews you've done, and some of them might be a bit older now, but you liked Constellation Software. And some of the, the spinoff talk that was around that, are those the types of companies that you like or have any thoughts on Constellation Software these days? Yes. I mean, I, I certainly do like Constellation Software and Topicus. I have both of them. Now, Constellation is very large, but both you know, really hit a lot of the things we're talking about. You've got really nice incentives in place, high returns on capital. They reinvest a lot and and shows in their results. You know, Constellation's been a monster. So hopefully Topicus will, will follow on the path of its parent. And, uh, but I like both of those. Also, you know, the competitively, their uh, vertical market software is tough to rip out, tough to compete with. So yeah, that definitely uh, checks a lot of the boxes we're talking about here. Yeah, and that company is like, Constellation software of Europe, essentially. And, you know, some people are saying it's maybe where Constellation was 10 years ago. So would you say maybe it's an opportunity to get something like Constellation, but earlier? I think so. I mean, it's not really a secret there. So Topicus is much more expensive than Constellation was 10 years ago. But yeah, I think that's kind of the analogy people are drawing is that Topicus will, over time, as it consolidates European market, will track something similar to what Constellation software itself has done, in which case it would be a very, very nice investment. I really like it. And uh, yeah, that's one I plan to hold for a long, long time. What's an example of a company that didn't work out for you so that we can all learn from your experience? Yeah, I mean, there are a lot of, a lot that didn't work out. I mean, uh, well, I mean, the most, the last company that I have sold was, uh, actually it was a company that I made a good profit on, but still will be, be kind of instructive perhaps to talk about. It was a company called Texas Pacific, wonderful economics and uh, with super high returns on capital. It's a royalty company basically on oil. So this is one of those rare companies that could grow without any additional capital. But unfortunately, it's in the clutches of a management team that maybe is not so shareholder friendly and not as shareholder friendly as I would like to see. So, you know, you could Google it and see all the, there's activist shareholders involved and there's been a lot of acrimonious letters going back and forth. And and so that was one where I finally uh, let it go for those reasons, for the corporate governance slipping. So that's an example when you see management teams start to go counter to what you think it should as, as far as being treating shareholders fairly and all that. That's a definite warning sign. And, and I think you'll find that at Investing Wisdom and Buffett and other people who talk about, you know, you've got to be with management teams you trust and people you trust. Do you tend to stay away from companies that are more so price takers and, and things like commodities? I would say yes, definitely. Tech specific was kind of more of an exception. But yeah, I mean, I would much, I generally don't look at commodities or any, any of those kinds of industries. I want to have a company that can raise prices and if it needs to. What other things would be warning signs for management? I know you talked about how founders and a founder-led company is typically a positive sign, but... Let's say, let's take Mark Leonard at Constellation. If he left, would the company still be as great as it is with him? Or like, how do you think about situations like that? Yeah, well, in the case of Constellation Software, I think they have a very deep bench. So I wouldn't, I mean, certainly losing Mark Leonard would be a big loss 
but I think that it would, that what he's built there and the culture and the management team he's got, that it would carry on pretty well. But yeah, this is a double-edged sword. And I remember Phelps used to talk about if you have too much reliance on one person, your heartbeat away from a problem. I always remember that expression. So there's a dual-edged sword there with entrepreneurs. I mean, you definitely would love to be invested alongside a founder, but then you do take on the risk that if something happens to that founder, what happens to the business? And hopefully the business is strong enough where they can continue without the founder as many great businesses have. There are other pitfalls though with management teams that you can look for. I mean, I like businesses where the management owns some decent percentage of stock. So there's a lot of skin in the game there. But even then you can still have situations where there's abuse. So... I mean, one obvious hurdle is if you find that the compensation of the executives is egregious, you know, even by standards of their peers in industry, if you think the incentives are not particularly fair or aligned. So, you know, I hate it when I see bonuses paid on sales growth or, you know, EBITDA, you know, increases. So those can be some, those can be red flags as well. And if you really dig deep, I mean, I spend time thinking about the culture of the business. So, you know, are the employees generally happy being there? And sometimes companies will report their turnover rate in their, te- in their 10K or in their annual filing, or they'll say something about their employees. Maybe their employees own a decent percent of stock as well because they promote an ownership culture. You know, those would be good signs. Hey everyone, it's Clay Fink here. Are you looking for an investment opportunity in a $2 trillion market? Look no further than Atacama, the cybersecurity industry's latest game changer. Atacama has opened its doors to US accredited and international investors alike already attracting over 5,000 investors and $6.5 million in capital. Atacama's recurring revenue model saw 10x revenue expansion in 2022 alone. They have patented technology and large contracts secured, including one with the U.S. Department of Defense. This is a limited time opportunity to get in on the ground floor of a rapidly growing cybersecurity startup. To learn more, simply visit invest.atacama.com dot com slash WSB. That is invest dot atacama, A-T-A-K-A-M-A dot com slash WSB. Full disclosure, I have personally invested in Atacama's equity crowdfunding round at a $29 million valuation. Please keep in mind that investments in early stage companies do contain risk. As with any investment, crowdfunding investments do offer attractive potential upside, but they cannot offer any guarantees of a future return. What pitfalls do you think that are common for investors to fall into when they're trying to search for hundred bagger opportunities like this, or just really any stock investment with great returns? Well, you know, I think partly they can get overly scared by the higher multiples that we paid that we talked about earlier. If you find a really high quality business, yeah, you may pay what may seem like a somewhat uncomfortable multiple um, in the beginning. So sometimes people get a little obsessed about about that. I think sometimes people get a, can fall into the trap of just looking for the growth, as we talked about before, and not for me, again, I focus on profitable companies. But if you're not going to do that, there's a lot more risks. You know, the companies that show eye pop and growth numbers that seem like they're going to grow for a long time, but their underlying business isn't really that good. And so that can be a pitfall as well. But most of the pitfalls I think people run into is they're just too short-term oriented in general. So they worry too much about whether the, there's going to be a recession or whether the market's going to crash or what the next quarter or two is going to look like. And, and then they get tripped up that way. What advice do you have for an investor right now who might be looking at some of the macro stuff that's going on and feeling a little doom and gloom? Yeah, I mean, I, I would say, you know, remember that these things have always happened and uh, Really, you look back any year, there's always some big concern and big worry. Really, I mean, it's rare that you have a year where there's not some big macro drama somewhere. And yet these companies have continued to perform. I mean, look at the long-term records of some of the big winners. I mean, they they had to suffer through all the recessions and, and then the drama that happened during the, during those stretches. So like I say, like I said earlier, I think it's important to develop some kind of other scorecard other than simply stock prices. And so really focus on those businesses. And as long as those businesses are performing well, there's not much else you can do. You know, you uh, let that uh, time is your friend on those kinds of investments. How do you think about doubling down? Let's say you see a company you really believe in that drops 30, 40, 50% in this market, but the fundamentals just haven't changed. Your investment philosophy or, or thesis hasn't changed. In your view, is that an opportunity for you to buy more and double down? 
Yeah, that's my first instinct would be if I have cash would be to buy more of that, more of that company. And so I have, you know, portfolio considerations too that, you know, I don't want to go too far into one name. So, you know, my, my own limit is 10% as far as adding to it. So if it appreciates more than that, that's okay. That's a good problem. I like that. But I don't want to push a name more than 10% of my portfolio because there's always chances you'll make a mistake. And so you don't want to sit there and put half your portfolio in one name and then you made a mistake and uh, then you get really hit hard. So there's some portfolio considerations there. You know, you I have only 10 names in my portfolio now. How do you handle runners in your stock portfolio? Let's say a company has just run up a tremendous amount. Now it's maybe 20% of your portfolio. What do you do in that situation? I love those. Those are great. And so um, that's why I say if it, uh, you know, I'm, I don't want to put more than 10% of my capital in any particular name, but if it appreciates and gets to 20 or 25, those are good. That's a good problem to have. And, and in fact, you know, if you look back at a lot of the great track records in investing, it's because they allowed a big winner to just run. So again, this is kind of a little bit personal preference too, because different people are in different situations. But for me, I'm very, very reluctant to trim anything. And so I prefer to just kind of let the portfolio just become unruly over time. And, and hopefully there will be a couple of big winners that will, that will carry most of the load. That's the nature of the beast. I think that's one of the hardest parts for me is when you see it go up substantially, you usually see valuations get extended. And, you know, sometimes it's hard to not, not take a bit of profit, but I also don't want to sell one of my best winners. So it, it, it's, it's hard. And, you know, especially if I don't need the cash or I don't have a great opportunity for it, it can be hard to know what you should really do with that money. Yeah, I think so. And then you have to think about, I mean, we're assuming that the business we're talking about are good quality businesses. There's lots of speculative things where, yeah, you should take it off the table or, or it should sell, uh, or maybe you shouldn't have bought in the first place and you were lucky. But think about all the things you have to get right. You know, if you're MO is to trim things. You know, you're paying taxes on the gains. Then you have to figure out what you're going to do with that money and what you do with it might be worse. You know, you might have been better off just leaving it with what you had. And so I know I try to think of it once I own a position, try to keep the number of decisions down as little as possible. Seems to do better. The less I touch it, the better it does. In your book, it was, it was fairly common to see that a lot of the hundred baggers weren't really confined to one sector. They were kind of all over the map. So how do you think about sector allocation or do you not even consider that? It's just whatever great businesses you find. Yeah, that's a great point to bring up because that's true. I mean, I think I had an impression that maybe when I started that there would be a lot of tech names would kind of dominate the list, but that wasn't the case at all. There were all different kinds of industries. So I don't consider industry affiliation other than from a like circle of confidence point of view, like I've not generally been a good retail investor. You know, retailers are kind of tough for me and I just sort of avoid that sector. I don't really do a lot in like pharma. You know, it's just those are sectors I don't really know much about. I don't feel comfortable there. There are certain industries I think are inherently would be off limits. And, you know, you mentioned banks. Ironically, banks, one of those things I would just don't look at. And again, that would be because I think in a concentrated portfolio, like I'm running, you know, 10 to 12 names, I can't take the sort of existential risk that comes with banks because they operate in, with a great deal of inherent leverage, and then they have funding risks on their in their balance sheet. So I don't look at banks. I, I'm unsure as I'm reluctant to get involved in for the same reasons that you know you could have a very good insurer running, and then all of a sudden you know you find out that they're taking all these risks that that were hard hard to figure out, and and then they surprise you with losses. So there's certain industries like that. I'll stay. We mentioned commodities would be another sector I kind of not look at. So other than those kinds of things, I mean, I'm willing to look at almost any kind of great business. How is your investing process, both for trying to find hundred baggers and just general investment process changed over time? How was it when you first got started versus how it is today? Yeah, it's changed a lot. It's changed a lot. I remember when I was first learning in my twenties, I was much more of like a Graham and Dodd style, you know, value investor looking to buy things at you know low below book value and low multiples of earnings and those sorts of things. And and it was a slow process, kind of gradually push more toward the quality spectrum. And I think that's probably a pretty common migration for a lot of investors. And Buffett himself went through that same kind of migration. So, you know, you start out doing a lot of different things and special situations and you dabble somewhat in turnarounds. And so I've kind of done everything. <laughs> but more and more I've pushed toward this 
And I think writing the book, Hundred Baggers, had a lot to do that with that as well. It was kind of a spark, especially accelerated it. Uh, so now that I'm 100% focused on this style of investing that I write about in, in the book, and I enjoy that style. I mean, you have to also pick an investing style that suits your temperament because the market's going to test you. And so if you're not, if they're not a good match there, you're probably switched at the worst possible time. So you have to kind of enjoy it. I mean, I, I like this approach too, because it, you really get into studying companies and you get to know them well. And I like that, seeing them sort of grow over time and following the story. I will make sure to put a link to your book in the show notes, but where else can the listeners go to learn more about you and everything that you do? Yeah, I'm on Twitter. So uh, Twitter handle is Chris W-M-A-Y-E-R. And uh, if you Google Woodlock House Family Capital, I have a website where I write an occasional blog. Uh, so you can check that out as well. Perfect. Thank you so much, Chris. Thanks for joining me on the show today. Thank you. Great questions. I want to own businesses that get to set their price. Price makers versus price takers may be the most unknown billionaire in the world. He has been completely away from the limelight, busy building one of the most impressive public companies, definitely in Canadian markets, but in the world as well. 